Hello and welcome to another episode of Musings. I'm Amrita Ghosh and I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome a guest who is my erstwhile colleague, co-writer, co-editor and friend, Dr. Elizabeth Redwine. And I want to begin with an introduction to Elizabeth. Elizabeth Brewer Redwine is a lecturer at Seton Hall University where we got introduced for the first time together and the coordinator of the first year core course at the university. In May, 2021, she published Gender, Performance and Authorship at the Abbey Theater with Oxford University Press. She edits the online journal, Critical Inquiries into Irish Studies with Martha Carpentier. She's thrilled to see our book, Tagore Yates, a Postcolonial Read Envisioning, that we wor both work together, a collection of essays with our own works that is soon awaited later this year with Brill Publications. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. So I want to begin with this book of, book of ours that we've been working on for the past five, six years. When I was with you at Seton Hall and then we moved on into different directions into different spaces, geographical spaces. And the question does come back, why Yeats and Tagore again? It's been a century since their births and there have been a plethora of um, books on them. So maybe we can start off with why the two gigantic Nobel winning authors once again. Well, as I'm sure you'll remember, this started with a conversation that we had as friends, and I know we're going to be talking about the politics of friendship, uh, years ago in a department meeting, and we, we looked high and low for a book length treatment of these two writers. We were able to find some chapters, a couple essays, but there was a real, um, there was no book length treatment that we were able to find there this is going to be the first one and I think we both also experienced a surprising to us as people who've been really immersed in the work of Tagore and Yates and in their collaborations and friendships over the years we were surprised at some of the misconceptions that continue into the 21st century about uh, Tagore in particular and his contributions. So part of this is some recovery work. And um, as I mentioned, as I've mentioned to you before, I have been at conferences where there is still a misconception about Tagore and his Nobel Prize. That old lie that Yeats somehow rewrote his works and rewrote Gitanjali, and this is how Tagore won the Nobel Prize, which we have sought out to prove as untrue. Um, it, it, it pervades for reasons that have to do with racism and Orientalism that we're gonna get into later. But I think, I think we both felt that this was a topic that needed a book length treatment. And what's been so wonderful about this edited collection is we have a number of different voices, international voices. Um, dealing with this question from people who study many different forms of critical theory and come at this question from many different positions. So I, I think it's really opened up um, this subject that, that hadn't really been treat, treated sufficiently before, in my opinion. Did you wanna to speak to, to that question as well? No, you're absolutely right. I think um, when I, and I still remember the moment, and I think it was not the only one, we both went to a conference together and there were some audience questions about why this obscurity about Tagore and very well-meaning um, emerging scholars even asked us to situate and place Tagore in world literature, something we also talk about in the book, that what it means to have a certain writer in world literature, whereas Yeats is Yeats, W.B. Yeats. Um, but I'm also interested in the volume, as you know, we, you know, you said something before about the politics of friendship, and that has not been something that has um, been analyzed or discussed when it comes to Tagore and um, Yeats. 
And I find it fascinating that in this backdrop of colonialism, uh, literary friendship came so close and yet fell apart. So we are also looking at these dynamics of how uh, friendship uh, derived from colonialism suffers a certain kind of power discourse, as you mentioned, Orientalism and so on. Um, so our key focus is, is how these two authors in their comparative studies through different aspects have been represented. So representation is key in our work in so many different ways. Um, I'm also interested, I wanna move on to um, something that you mentioned regarding your own work. Um, and I know you mentioned your work that has come out this year, um, but you also work on a certain kind of performance in this, a particular book in your section, and it is titled for the audience, Meeting the British, Yates, Tagore, and Self-Fashioning. Could you tell us a little more about your section in the book and how you deal with um, aspects of representation of the two authors? Absolutely. So we, the story of Yates and Tagore's friendship is embedded in this 1912 dinner. Um, at William Rothenstein's house. And, and we talk about this in various chapters in the book. So one issue that my chapter sets out to debunk is that myth. And what we have to do is look at the myth of that dinner and how the quote to Gore craze took off while exposing the truth of what really happened. And what really happened is that Tagore was very familiar with London and with British culture and Irish culture. So for our listeners, this myth of the Tagore craze um, happened after this dinner in 1912, where British and Irish writers met Tagore and were struck by how he represented himself. And unfortunately, in some Orientalist tropes, described him as this Christ-like figure, um, a creature, on, a sweet creature on display, very problematic. It's all complicated, though, because that dinner did lead to this very fruitful collaboration with Yeats, which later fall apart, fell apart. But for a while, there was a real ex cultural exchange. But one thing my chapter sets out to do is to look at two things. One, how Yeats represented himself when he first came to London in some Celtic tropes that tie in with Orientalism. And second, how Tagore and his family had a much longer history in London than the Yeats family did in many ways. So in, 1814, in 1846, Tagore's grandfather had dined with Charles Dickens, dined with Queen Victoria, I was just telling my partner Someone has to write a book about those dinners because those are as fascinating as the one in 1912. In fact, his grandfather died on a visit to London and Tagore himself came to London when he was 17. So when he came in 1912, he was 50 years old. He'd gone through so much familial loss. He had visited at 17 years old. His sisters had gone to school there. Um, so this idea of Tagore showing up in 1912 and exploding on the scene was made by this publicity machine. The other aspect that I just want to mention briefly is that Yeats, a really important part of the story is, has to do with class and money. Um, and the Yeats family and the Tagore family's anomalous position as both colonial subjects, Irish and Indian, and part of families that traded with the British um, out of necessity. So the Tagore family was much wealthier than the Yates family and Yates was raised with a real awareness of finances and class because they were always having to try to make up for that financial lack. Part of that had to do with an 1887 performance that Yates does as the wild Celt in an image that I include in the book and that I read very closely. And after that image came out in the British press, he was described as, quote, an Eastern magician. I'm referring to Yeats here. So there's this strange overlap. Um, at the same time, as we will see, there are places that Yeats could walk as an Anglo-Irish man that 
were blocked off to Tagore or that were more difficult for Tagore. So I'm kind of trying to expose all of this that's I think been, been lost in many ways to literary history and make those connections. Um, I would love to hear more about your chapter, Amrita. So in your chapter, Tagore's Radical Art and Yeats's Intermedial Dance, how do you talk about both writers and some of these intersectional issues? And I love what you do with performance too. So I'm, I'm so excited about your chapter. I'd love to hear you talk about it. Um, thank you. Um, I absolutely uh, loved your work. And I think we overlap in very interesting ways in our section um, in the book. And what I looked at in both writers is something that is ignored or sort of sidelined, especially with Tagore. Um, he was an artist and he has collections of paintings um, that are not really at the forefront, he's remembered, obviously, as the writer and the genius of his works. Um, um, but his painting struck me as something always being talked about um, in a kind of a derivative of Eurocentric modernism. So what I'm trying to uh, locate in both the writers is this kind of uh, very interesting, resisting, a uh, radical approach to certain trends that um, in Tagore's case that I'm talking about, his art is uh, definitely rebelling against a kind of a nationalist um, art his, um, history, historiography, and um, situating itself different as grotesque. I call it the uh, grotesque, post-colonial grotesque modernism. And what I'm trying to show is that his artwork, and I study a couple of very um, key images in, um, in paintings, they're incongruous, they're shocking to a certain degree, um, they're distorted, very different from the kind of paintings, even as you mentioned, uh, Rothenstein, the painter, did on Tagore. So he himself imagined his self-portraits are very different. They're distorted images um, and the other kinds of collections that he had um, after that. So I'm, I'm trying to argue that Tagore's grotesque modernist art um, has a kind of a subvertive um, structure to colonial uh, colonialism and patriarchy in the time. Um, and in that context, I call it the post-colonial grotesque in, in his art. And with that, I found, and you mentioned the Tagore evening that kind of catapulted Tagore into fame. When it comes to Yeats, I'm looking at uh, the 1916 collaboration that Yeats had with the Japanese dancer and chore choreographer, uh, Michio Ito. And the specific one, um, dance drama uh, called At the Hawk's Well, written by Yeats. And there's a lot that has been written about this kind of um, performative modernism between uh, what Yeats does in the play. What I'm trying to locate is, you know, in, in the similar way that Tagore came into fame, Michio Ito um, in 1914 also had this kind of an evening uh, where he met all of these noted writers in a private party, um, this artistic bigwigs of the time, Yeats, Pound, Thomas Dirge Moore. And then soon he became this kind of um, toast of society as it was called uh, by a certain scholar. And um, then Yeats collaborates with Ito to create this unique dance movement in the theater. And I'm really interested in the kind of alternative imaginaries it has um, it, it presents uh, not just for identity, but also for the body, also for breaking boundaries and borders for human animal imaginations. There is a mask that is adorned um, by um, this um, particular character um, that is played by Edo. So there are different modalities of being uh, a reminder also of Tagore's art of human and the beast. So I find these fascinating intersections in their visual arts. Um, and I call in, in the case of Yeats, I, I call that uh, kind of a nascent stage of intermediality um, that, you know, in the, in the definition of the term, um, it is, um, I, I take the definition from Patrick Millian's fascinating work of intermediality, um, and he calls it uh, when one 
particular medium is integrated with the qualities of another, and then these be become sites to break certain boundaries and make a different kind of meaning with cooperation, with certain kinds of flexibilities, but potential dynamism in, in these spaces. And I find that fascinating that Yeats's um, collaboration with Ido provides that kind of um, sort of resistant spaces of, of not just identity, but looking at the body. So I, 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 there's a lot of work in avant-garde plays and putting his um, theater in, in that genre. And I'm looking at how this became a hybrid form, uh, not just of Japanese no theater, but uh, it had um, collaborations with Indian theater, for example, Bengali folk drama. So there's been a lot of these interesting intersections that um, have intermediality posed onto Yeats's uh, work with Michio Ito. So that's what I'm working on in, in my section of the book. I want to go back um, and look at something that I love talking about, especially when it comes to um, us collaborating also in the book. And that is what you said, the politics of friendship. And it rarely gets the focus. We all know there had been a friendship and there had been a fallout. But how do you see the post-colonial um, understandings or readings of Tagore and Yeats's friendship during a very colonial time? And what have you as the writer and editor who's worked on this volume um, gained from working on um, a focus on the friendship? Yeah, that's such a wonderful question. And I also love talking about this and find it really interesting. and you know, we started out as friends and colleagues and writers, and we came together and wrote. And it's just been really fascinating to go through all of this with you. And Amrita, when I think about how many hours we've spent, you know, talking about these two figures and talking about our own successes and struggles as writers and researchers, researchers and friends, uh, it's really interesting to think about it down the centuries. I think in some ways it, it gives an updated perspective on this friendship. Um, but there's a funny way that when Tagore won the, the Nobel Prize in 1913, there was this uproar that to me reads as a racist response in England. Many British people wanted Thomas Hardy to win. Uh, Yates was muted on this. He did not, he did not join in that chorus. Um, but that was just a year after that evening in 1912. And I read some, I, I, I work on Yates and collaboration. And there's a way in which Yates did his best work when he collaborated with women or with people from cultures outside his own. So Michito Ito, you've already brought up, um, the actresses he, he collaborated with in my other work and in his relationship with Tagore. My perception is that a lot of the tension that came out of that interaction with Tagore had to do with some tension that Yates felt and I'm, I'm imagining this, but I base this in a strong knowledge of Yeats's biography. I think it was, it, I think it was frustrating for Yeats to see someone who had the class and financial backing that he wished that he had. Um, so I think that was a tension in their relationship. I haven't looked into this too much, but my sense is they both may have had feelings for Iselt Gunn at some point. Maud Gunn's daughter. So I've just found some letters where that are fascinating where Tagore is writing Yeats and he's saying, how did that wonderful young woman, how's she doing on learning Bengali? I mean, I don't know, but um, I have read some critics who have suggested this might have been an issue. Um, it's, it's complicated. I think also the work that they both did on the post office. So the post office was the one production by Yeats's sister's Koala Press that was not a homegrown Irish text, which is both amplifying to core, 
It was amplifying Tagore by Tagore. So it amplified Tagore. It also in some ways to me appropriates Tagore because of the purpose of Koala Press is to publish Irish literatures, then are we claim, you know, is Yates claiming the post office? So it's so complicated that friendship because yes, of course it reached many more people because it was published by the Koala Press. But if Koala Press is set out for Irish literature and then we have Mukherjee, the translator who kind of disappears from view, who Amrit and I have tried to find out more about. So these friendships are complicated and they have to do with the other relationships that people have. Um, you know, with Ezra Pound, both men had collaborative relationships with Ezra Pound too. So every collaborative friendship has a satellite of other friendships and relationships that are affected by it. It's not like that friendship existed in a vacuum. And then I wanna hear your thoughts on this, Amrita, but there's the whole tension around their relationships with their nations, which were far from simple. So I would love to hear your thoughts on the politics of friendship between Yates and Tagore, some reflections on our collaboration, and then anything you wanted to say about their sort of anomalous positions in their two nations. Mm -hmm. This is fascinating to me because I, I find um, their friendship really ambiguous in so many ways. And um, it's complex. It really starts off, as you mentioned, in a fruitful collaboration, but then ends up um, really with how the fourth friendship with Ezra Pound also ends. And I think that's another volume or book to be written in, in what happened between those two writers. But coming back to Yates and Tagore, um, you know, when we worked on the introduction for this particular focus on the friendship itself, um, I found it fascinating that the scholarship or, or the critical works on friendship by Derrida or uh, Mike Ball, whose work is really influential um, in so many different ways, they all look at friendship as um, providing transformative spaces or potential to change or create visions towards a certain kind of futurity of inclusion. Um, but this kind of anti-colonial um, friendship, if we can call it that, really becomes a kind of derived friendship from colonial structures. And I think that's what makes it really suffer um, and uh, the aspect of jealousy is also there. I mean, Tagore won the Nobel before, a decade before Yeats, and that has to play up in, in certain ways. And you mentioned, you know, the immediate reaction of the British um, national press was not kind to Tagore at all. And I think it was Bernard Shaw who also um, had a very derogatory phrase for Tagore um, in the aftermath of the Nobel. Um, Yeats himself had something, um, had some very hard stuff to say, negative stuff to say. So in that kind of um, up and down, this, this kind of structure of friendship, I feel that it's not a simple trajectory. And also you mentioned the two nations. I also think that it is a simplified kind of reading that sometimes happens in terms of Irish and Indian anti-colonial resistance automatically makes the two writers in a certain kind of solidarity in an anti-colonial resistance. While that is, is, is true, we also forget the kind of problematic historical um, complexity involved with um, Irish um, incorporations of colonialism. Uh, for example, there's this fascinating work um, about uh, the, the famous Jallianwala Bagh massacre in 1919. And um, that um, Michael O'Dwyer, if I remember the name correctly, he was an Irish lieutenant governor in, the, in Punjab at that time, who actually directed the massacres and, and, and the violence against uh, women and children. So there, there are these kinds of problematic uh, complex nuances uh, of Irish people who uh, created their careers in the East India Company during the time. And this is not to suggest that this had anything to do with Yates per se, 
and that he was pro-colonialism, not at all, but rather that the friendship had a subtext of colonialism, of Orientalism, and all, all the kinds of different aspects of class and um, um, histories you mentioned, that it was a limited cross-cultural collaboration. And you know, when I, when I mentioned Nikeval's work on friendship, she has this wonderful phrase of critical intimacy of friendship from where uh, both learn and um, friendship becomes a sort of knowledge production. And I don't think it became that towards the end when we when we talk about Tagore and Yeats's friendship. Um, with, with, the, with turning it to us collaborating in this volume, it has been fascinating because A, as women collaborators, I learned a lot. I mean, that's another subject to be written about, I think. And then we both have talked about it so many times. Um, but it has been fascinating to see that friendship and critical intimacy can become spaces of knowledge production, especially when it came to working on this book. Um, I want to turn to one last topic, um, and that is the noble itself. You, you mentioned the Nobel Prize, you mentioned the co-opting of certain um, things, especially post office also this kind of misrepresentation of Tagore with this kind of saintliness and the aura that he had and some very problematic stuff that had been written about him with his um, during his journeys to even Scandinavia from where I'm speaking right now. Um, and, you know, this last week has been um, a fascinating news of Abdul Razak Gurna winning the Nobel Prize in Literature. But there have also been these underlying currents and talks about that he's an unknown writer, um, obscure. And the question does need to be made, obscure or unknown for whom? You know, he's been around and, you know, I've read his works um, for the longest time. And th this kind of a literary genius being called unknown begs us to question, um, many things about publication industry, about readerships, but how can we then think about um, the question about the noble controversy, you know, intersecting it with Yeats and Tagore and also looking at the present moment? That's such a great question. And I was just thinking about that this morning um, because when I, in my other book in Yeats's Nobel acceptance speech in 1923, he thanks these actresses. So he's gesturing towards the collaboration that I wrote about in my other book, but the two are absolutely related. And one issue that we discuss in the introduction and in other places in the book is our interest in dispelling this myth you know, that Yeats, this translations. I mean, Yeats didn't speak Bengali, so I don't know where this myth comes from. Um, well, I do. I mean, I think, I think the British public was very threatened in 1913. Um, and, you know, they wanted Thomas Hardy to win this, this Nobel Prize. And one thing that one discovery that Amrita and I made is that in fact, and this was mostly in large part your work, Amrita, that the Nobel Committee in Sweden, there were people on the committee who spoke Bengali, who read widely in Tagore's oeuvre. So that right there disproves this theory. And speaking as someone in America right now, I have seen firsthand how dangerous false and in viral information can be. And I feel like this misapprehension about Tagore's Nobel win is another one of these old racially charged orientalist tropes that we just we, we need to cut it off at the head because again the people on the prize committee spoke Bengali they did not need Yeats's translation and Yeats did not speak Bengali so there was no translating that Yeats did this is not to take away from Yeats's inspirations during their friendship. I think their friendship was successfully collaborative. One point I wanted to make earlier that I just wanna make really quickly is that Tagore himself had long been fascinated with Irish literature. So I think there's a way that 
critical studies over the years have looked at Yates's response to Tagore more than Tagore's response to Yates, and that's one imbalance we're seeking to redress. And as a young man in his teenage years, Tagore would translate the work, The Irish Melodies by Thomas More into Bengali and sing them and sing them in, in English as well. So there's a way that both of them were looking towards that friendship. Yeats's Crossways, his earliest collection of poetry is mostly poetry about Indian themes. So I love to imagine that meeting because Tagore had long been obsessed with these ideas of Ireland and Yeats had long been obsessed with these ideas of India. So, you know, I think that, I think that we, it's, it's very complicated. And I think there was some fruitful collaboration that led to these two Nobel prizes. I don't see either of them winning the Nobel without working with the other. At the same time, we have to be really careful to work against this false narrative that somehow Yeats, you know, helped Tagore help the language of Gitanjali to win the Nobel Prize. That was not the basis for Tagore's Nobel Prize. And I, I, I know I keep saying this, but I'm trying to push against a false narrative. And again, as an American living in 2021, I, I see the danger of not being honest about literary history. And it matters who gets credit. And it matters how we remember these writers. Um, and it's changed my teaching. You know, when I teach Tagore now, I'm very clear about this because I know my students are going to be walking, reading in his in critical worlds where they might hear this false narrative. So I, I can't speak enough about how important that is. You're absolutely right. I'm thinking of uh, the immediate um, the reactions that came out after Tagore won the Nobel. And there was one particular report I think um, had mentioned in 1914 that it was practically a production of Yeats. And that's the kind of danger you're talking about that in the volume, and I'm going to be very thankful to our amazing contributors from across um, borders uh, transnationally um, who work on the reception and also the representation of these writers um, and the co collaboration, but also questions of appropriation and agency in authorship. Um, you know, there's this chapter on translation on, on the introduction to Gitanjali that um, Yeats writes and what kind of ethos and um, structures of representation does, does that bring in? And then we have um, um, another scholar writing about the reception of these two writers in a certain kind of intersection from the Far East in China. So I, I think that what we have tried is exactly that kind of uncovering and to be really critical in how we understand um, a, a prize like Nobel without, uh, you know, with looking into the hegemonic structures of power discourses that lay out. And that brings us back into uh, Gurna's fascinating prize, rightfully deserved last week, but the US publication industry, I'm told, had still probably 3,000 copies circulated of his works. His works are not there. And I'm guessing this, this award is going to change that um, in, in the near future or at the present moment. But I want to thank you for this fascinating conversation. And I can't wait to have the book in our hands and celebrate with you. At, in the same time zone. <laughs> I'm so grateful to you, Amrita, from the bottom of my heart for being such a wonderful friend and co-editor. I really cannot imagine these past years of intellectual inquiry without you. And we will have another podcast maybe where we talk about some really interesting moments in our own friendship and our experience as women scholars um, during this really 19, uh, 19, 2015 to 2021, these very tumultuous years uh, in terms of global studies and feminist studies. So I think, well, that, that'll be our rain check. That'll be our next conversation because this has been so much fun. It, it's a material for a book and we cannot forget the pandemic and how it stalled our work in incredibly, 
uh, unthinkable ways and how we navigated as women scholars all through that. So I thank you. I'm so grateful for you to be my co-editor and writer in this book and for future. Thank you for this podcast. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you, Amrita. Thank you.